Good morning, church. Welcome, everyone. We're so glad that you've gathered with us to meet in our second worship service this morning. We had very good attendance in the early service, and uh, it's noticeably more quiet around here today because of all the young people that are gone. Uh, they are traveling this weekend for a youth retreat in Gatlinburg, Tennessee. They and all of the uh, 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 chaperones is the word I'm looking for. And they'll be traveling back this afternoon. So remember them in your prayers, and we'll pray for them together here this morning. But to all of you that are here, uh, welcome, and we're so glad you chose to worship with us this morning. If you're a guest with us this morning, do us this one favor that we ask of you. Tear out this portion inside your bulletin. Fill this out with some basic information so that we can pray for you and follow up with you and say thank you for choosing to worship with us today. Now for the rest of us, take a moment to look inside the bulletin with me. And just very quickly, let me draw your attention to a few things. I want to make sure you know all that's going on today. There are a couple of changes to the normal schedule over on the left. Uh, there will be no singing Christmas tree meeting today. That's actually next Sunday. So if you're part of the singing Christmas tree, that's really going to be picking up speed here soon. But next Sunday will be the meeting there. And then the Berean Bible readers, I think we just forgot to take that out from last week because we met last Sunday. So there's no Berean Bible readers today. Make sure you know about those two. And parents, if you have any kids that didn't go to the retreat, I don't think they'll be meeting tonight for a formal youth service uh, when they come back. Uh, so just go ahead and, and mark that off. I would expect, does anybody know that they're probably just going to come back and let the kids go home, aren't they? Yes, okay, yeah, sounds, sounds good. So uh, just make sure you make those uh, changes. Now over on the right-hand side of your bulletin, please make note, veterans, uh, if we don't have you already in our database of veterans, please let us know. Uh, we're going to be honoring our vets next Sunday, and we want to make sure that everyone deserving honor gets that honor. The Grant County Community Food Drive. Now, we were supposed to distribute bags yesterday, but we didn't have a team go out. So... Right after this service is over today, I'm going to take any volunteers that will help me. And we've got about two or 300 bags to distribute in this community right here in Williamstown to houses and neighborhoods. If you can help with that, uh, stick around and be a part of that with me. Just meet me outside my office. I'll tell you where we're going to go. I'll give you some bags and we'll give them all distributed. And then next Sunday, Saturday rather, we're going to be picking those up. So there's a sign-up sheet in the Welcome Center for those who can help pick them up. All of that is going to go to Helping Hands, and it's used all around our community all year. Now, men, if you're interested in the trap shoot, please see Troy. The poinsettias, we need the orders for those by November the 11th, so don't forget them. See the announcements there about Operation Christmas Child. Super Seniors, your catered luncheon. Boy, this is big, isn't it? This is, your, this is the biggest catered meal of the year for the Super Seniors. Raise your hand up, Miss Brenda. Brenda needs to know if you plan on coming by this Wednesday so they can order enough meals. $13 per person, this is catered. Anyone and everyone is welcome. We want you to attend, but please let Miss Brenda know on time so they can place the proper orders for food. And then on the back side of the connection card, please make note of the upcoming uh, community service here at the church on Sunday, November the 18th with our fellow churches from the community and this coming Wednesday night's meal menu. Now everybody take out this green section inside your bulletin for one second. If you will turn it over to the back, I want you to see that there's a simple guide here for you to pray for the body of Christ around the world that is persecuted. Today is what's called International Day of Prayer for the persecuted church and all around the world. Christian churches are called upon to remember our brothers and sisters in Christ who are surviving day by day in areas where persecution is a reality. We'll be talking about them a little bit more tonight in the evening service, but I hope each and every one of you will take this and maybe keep it in your Bible and pray for the persecuted church regularly. Okay? Turn with me this morning for our call to worship to the book of Romans, chapter 13. The New Testament book of Romans, chapter 13. And as you stand with me to your feet, I want us to remember today that we are blessed in God's providence to live in a free nation 
whereby the sovereign graces of God, we have a government that we're allowed to participate in. This coming Tuesday is election day, and I hope and I pray. Did you guys know that, by the way, election day is coming up? Did you hear about that, anything about it? Okay, I, I thought so. You might be sick of hearing about it. But I hope each and every one of you will get out Tuesday and exercise your right to vote. I'm not going to tell you how. You need to follow the leadership of the Lord's Spirit. Vote for whichever candidates will help to establish righteousness and peace. Vote for those that will advocate for the values that are precious to you. But get out there and vote this coming Tuesday. And let's be reminded of why in Romans chapter 13 this morning, beginning in verse 1. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God. And those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval. For he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore, one must be in subjection not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. For the same reason, you also pay taxes. For the authorities are ministers of God, attending to this very thing. Pay to all what is owed to them, taxes to whom taxes are owed, revenue to whom revenue is owed, respect to whom respect is owed, honor to whom honor is owed. And all of God's people say, Amen, in response to his word. Let's pray together this morning. Father, as we begin our corporate time of worship together today, we are reminded not only of opportunities to be good and active church members, we have lots of opportunities to serve, to bless others around us, to help to alleviate hunger in our community, to give to children around the world. We have great opportunities to live out and show the love of Christ through our church. But we're also reminded this morning that we have an opportunity to be good citizens this week. We, Lord, are just blessed. We didn't deserve it, but by your sovereign goodness, we have been born into a country where there is freedom, where there are political processes that we can participate in. And so help us this week to be wise, to be discerning, to be prayerful, above all, to be active, to exercise our rights to vote this week, and to pray for our president, our senators, our congressmen, our governors, our judges, for all who are in authority. Father, that you might use them to help establish peace and prosperity in a land so that your church can preach the gospel and make disciples. Now we're glad that we have this morning to gather and to worship and we pray that you'll watch over those members of our body who are not with us for the dozens and dozens in Gatlinburg this morning, Lord. Protect them as they travel. Bless our young people that they may hear and respond to the gospel today. We pray for those who are caring for them and chaperoning that trip that you would watch over them as well. Father, for the sick, for the shut-ins, for those unable to be with us, may your presence be a blessing to them today. And now for us who are here, Lord, as we lift our voices in song, as we give, as we greet, as we commune together around your table, and as we hear your word, change us. Change us from the inside out so that we might leave here today more like Jesus Christ, your perfect son. We pray all in his name. Amen. Show your love for your neighbor this morning by finding someone close to you and greeting them in the name of Christ, welcoming them to worship this morning. Acapella of nothing but the blood. Oh, 
to worship the Lord through giving. And that's what it is. It's worship. It's worship of the Lord through giving. We, we give to advance His kingdom through the church, and the preaching of the gospel, and the benevolence of those around us. Before you have an opportunity to do that this morning, I'm going to ask Daniel if he would bless this offering today to the furtherance of God's kingdom. seated. watch this next video I just have one quick announcement if you have children in kindergarten through uh, fifth grade that are interested in being in our children's choir we will be meeting tonight at 5 30 and now is the time to come if your child wants to sing and is a part of the Christmas tree with us we'll be participating in several things of the holiday season so if they haven't come yet just bring them on tonight at 5 30 and we would love to have them and let them be a part of that uh, this next video that we're going to watch, uh, Pastor Lee has already alluded to this, that uh, today is the day of prayer for the persecuted church. And uh, this, this uh, video is heart-wrenching. When you watch it, you will be moved by it. And I hope that it uh, prompts you to spend a lot of time in prayer this week for our brothers and sisters in other places that are suffering for the name of Christ but also have great joy because of the name of Christ. Hallelujah, Thank you. 
Today in Pakistan, we Christians are second class citizens. Though we have committed no crime, we are ostracized and banished to the lowest place in society. Often we are forced to leave our villages and our own homes. We cannot get good jobs. And we have no voice in government. What is left for us is servitude. Sewage work. And we know we will never advance. church, a place where Christians come together to worship the Lord Jesus Christ, to sing His praise, to study His word. For while our country has turned its back on us, God has not. Sometimes it is not easy. The loss, the injustice. So please remember to pray for us. That we will continue to live together in fellowship. That we will continue to see the joy of the Lord in our lives and that we will persevere in our faith no matter the cost. And please remember, we are praying for you. singing how can we keep from singing and today I want you to have that thought in your heart as we stand and we sing oh Lord my rock and my redeemer it's a CD
share the cup, we, we rightly focus on some central themes. Oftentimes at communion we focus on internal repentance. We're mindful of Paul's words that when we come to the table a man must examine himself and then so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. We're reminded to, to ask the Spirit of God to search us out internally and bring us to quick repentance for things in our lives that may be hidden. Other times when we come to the table, we speak not so much of internal repentance, but external reconciliation. And that's certainly a key theme surrounding the Lord's table and communion. That our horizontal relationships, one with another in the body of Christ, ought to match our vertical relationship with God. And as He has forgiven us and given grace to us, so too we ought to extend that grace and reconciliation one to another. And it's at times of communion that you should be encouraged to be reconciled with anyone in the body of Christ that you perhaps have a distance between relationally, you and them. But there's another theme that Paul in that same passage in 1 Corinthians 11 brings to the surface that we don't often emphasize enough. And this morning, as we meditate on his word to prepare our hearts for communion, I want you to think about Paul's words. I'm reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and Paul says, beginning in verse 23, that he had received from the Lord what he had also delivered to the Corinthians, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed, he took bread. That would have, of course, been the, the Passover bread. And when he had given thanks, he took that bread, and in the presence of his disciples, he broke it. And he said to them, verse 24, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. 
Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. So by the words of Jesus, we're reminded that these elements, the bread and the cup, there's nothing magical or special about these in the sense that that something magical is going to happen to you when you partake of them. It doesn't work that way. They're special because of what they mean to us in the body of Christ. Their significance derives from that which they symbolize. For all believers who partake, and that is who communion is for. It is for those who have believed and professed faith in Christ and been baptized and are in fellowship with their church. When you partake of this bread and this cup, you are saying to everyone around you, you believe in the broken body of Jesus Christ and in the shed blood of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins. But Paul says in verse 25 to the church, as often as you do this, as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, listen church, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So there's internal examination, there's external reconciliation, and there is universal proclamation tied to the Lord's table. Some of you would say, if pressured, well, 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 I'm not a speaker. I'm not one who will ever be able to get up and speak to crowds. And some of you will say, well, I can't teach, and, and God hasn't put that burden on me, and don't, don't ask me to pray, don't ask me to speak. But this morning, you get to proclaim a message. For by participating in, partaking of the bread and the cup, you are saying without hesitation to those around you, that you are among those that believe that salvation comes through Jesus Christ alone. There may be people here today who are not Christians. There may be people here today for the first time just sort of seeking out and feeling out uh, what they believe and they don't know about their relationship with Christ. They're going to see you. And although not audibly, they're going to hear you proclaim with your actions that you believe forgiveness of sins rests in the appropriation of Christ's broken body and his shed blood. So as you prepare to preach this morning, church, bow with me for a few moments of that silent examination. Pray about the relationships you have within the body of Christ, and let's ask God to make us a congregation of proclaimers. Father, Speak to us now and prepare our hearts to receive these simple elements. Unleavened bread and fruit of the vine represented in pure grape juice. To some, these are insignificant. But to us, they mean everything because they, they remind us of what is at the core, the heart of our faith. We get hung up on a lot of things. We get distracted and sidetracked by a lot of issues in the church. But Lord, today bring us back together as one body and remind us that we are called to be proclaimers of your grace and your love and your mercy as mediated through Christ your Son. For anyone present today that may not be a believer, Lord, may, may these next few moments speak as loudly as any sermon that I preach. May they know from this church, that salvation is possible by faith because of your grace as we trust in the broken body of Jesus Christ and his shed blood. May we ponder our own reconciliation with you and with one another in these moments. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
a wise minister of the gospel once taught me, this is not special and significant every time you do it. He said it ought to be like kissing your spouse. It should always be special and never lose its significance because of the intimacy of the relationship. So as we partake together of the bread this morning, we remember Christ's words when he said that night, gathered with his disciples, this is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. We remember together the Lord Jesus Christ's crucified body. And in similar fashion, he took the cup of the Passover meal and pointed to his own imminent death when he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this, and as often as you drink it, do it in remembrance of me. Lord Jesus, we remember your blood shed for us together. Amen. Using just our voices, sing that chorus we sang earlier. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Amen. You men, thank you for serving this morning. You can return to your families. With the time I have remaining this morning, yes, our children can head down to the Sunday morning children's study, Jesus and Me, or, or, or I think we're calling it BAM, Bible and Me. So we've got BAM, JAM, and I think we need something else for the third service. We've got Jesus and Me on Wednesdays, Bible and Me on Sundays, JAM, BAM, Slam, yeah, slam a lamb a ding dong or something. I don't know. We got to get them kids down there. But uh, while they're headed there, I want you to turn to the book of Jonah with me this morning. Jonah chapter four. Jonah chapter four. And I'm not going to be able to finish this series today. Communion Sundays cut me a little bit short on time for teaching, but. I want to introduce this subject to you this morning in Jonah chapter 4. We said last week in chapter 3 that we often pray for revival. Oh God, revive us. Oh God, revive your church. We sing songs like, revive us again. Now just listen for a moment. Listen to the words to this because we sing it all the time. But we tend to kind of sing without thinking about what we're singing. Revive us again. What's next? Fill each heart with what? Thy love. Have you ever thought about those words when you sing it? Fill our hearts with your love. And then we say, may our souls be rekindled with fire from above. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen, hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. But let me ask you a very serious question. I, don't, I, I hope this jolts you and shocks you a little bit. Do you really think you want God to do that? Do you really want the kind of revival that you pray for and sing about so frequently? We're known for asking for things and then complaining when we get them, aren't we? A couple of months ago, most of you all that live around here were complaining about the heat. Oh, dear Lord, it's so hot outside. It's so humid. It's so muggy. Give us cooler weather. And what'd you say this morning when you stepped outside? Oh, it's so cold. Oh, Lord, send us the warm sunshine again and then when it gets up to 100 degrees or, or when it gets down to 20 degrees this winter you'll be crying and praying for summertime and when summertime comes and it's 100 degrees you'll be crying and praying for the cool weather of the winter uh, that's just what we do that's the old saying be careful what you ask for you might just get it right 
Do we really want God to revive us in such a way that he would fill our hearts with his love and that he would rekindle our souls in such a way that the world around us would be changed? Do we want that? I want you to pause before you answer that this morning and think through it with me. I mean, what would actually happen if we as a church had our Acts 2.41 moment? You all know what Acts 2.41 is, right? You got the whole chapter memorized, I'm sure, Acts chapter 2. Well, you don't. Let me catch you up then. In Acts chapter 2, Peter is preaching to the multitudes. He's preaching to the masses gathered in Jerusalem about Jesus Christ. And he's telling them about Jesus' crucifixion. And he's telling them that this was indeed the Messiah who presented himself to Israel. This is the one the prophets spoke of. And we put him to death. And he died as the substitute, the sacrifice for our sins. And he rose from the dead. At the end of Peter's preaching, something happened. Acts chapter 2 and verse 41 tell us that those who received his word, that is, they believed in what Peter preached, were baptized that day, and there were added to the church about 3,000 souls. Now we read that and we go, oh man, that's great, oh that's awesome, they were, oh man, revival, 3,000 people got saved. But let me ask you a question, Williamstown Baptist Church. Do you want to go from 120 to 3,120 in a week? Because that's, that's what the early church was before the preaching of Peter, right? Acts chapter 1 and verse 15 says there was about 120 of them. And think about that 120. That 120, listen, they were related. They all knew each other well. They were comfortable with each other. They had shared experiences that they could bank on. They had fellowshiped and eaten meals together. And they had done all kinds of things together. They had been in that church for years. The 120 had. They were already a part of this. And in one moment, in one sermon, in one afternoon, they go from 120 that they know to 3,120. And immediately... People within that congregation, we'll say the First Baptist Church of Jerusalem, they realized that this thing was out of their control. How would you respond, Williamstown? If the Lord filled our hearts with his love and we preached the gospel and 3,000 people in a Sunday came forward and said, in response to our prayer for revival, we want to receive Jesus and be a part of this church. What would actually happen, let's be real, what would actually happen if God poured out his spirit in such a mighty way in this church? Some would rejoice and some of the 120 would get mad and leave. Some of you would. You'd get upset and you'd leave. See, we are mistaken. We are sorely mistaken if we believe that all of God's people anticipate and participate and celebrate in the working of God in the world around us. It doesn't happen that way. We're mistaken if we think that everyone together would anticipate that kind of outpouring of the Spirit or that they would participate in it or that they would celebrate it when it happens. Here's what's more likely to happen, precisely the opposite of rejoicing. If such a thing happened in most churches today, we would begin to hear the following types of, of things circulating. We would begin to hear people say, oh, I can't believe we've got all these new people coming into our church. Oh, I've, I've lost my pew. Someone else is sitting in it. I mean, after all, 3,000 people, we'd have to put people in Memorial Hall. We'd have to put them downstairs. We'd have them standing out in the parking lot. If you didn't get here real early, you wouldn't have your pew. And that would be problematic for some people, wouldn't it? You might not even have your parking spot because somebody else may have taken it. And Lord help us, trouble of all troubles, we would run out of bulletins, Marcy, the first week. 
And that's all we'd be talking about, wouldn't it? We're out of bulletins. What are we going to do? Someone's in my pew. Someone's taken my parking spot. And there would be complaints by many. Because what they know and cherish and what's comfortable to them and what they treasure and what has always been theirs and, and the families that have always kind of been in control and the families that have always taken care of things, all of a sudden, they're not in control anymore. There's way too many people. And these people, by the way, they're so different than us. Their skin is dark. They speak weird languages. They smell funny. They eat bad foods. They don't do things with their kids the way we do them. And, and pastor, we need to have a talk about this. How are these people going to fit into our church? People would probably start talking about the authenticity of their conversions. Can all these people really? I mean, come on, preacher. Did they really get saved? Maybe we ought to wait a few months before adding them to the role. We ought to just watch them for a while and keep our eyes on them and make sure these are the kind of people that we want in our church. Is their conversion authentic? What kind of changes will they bring to our gathering of 120? See, I'm not convinced that all of us would be thrilled if the Lord answered our prayer for revival. Some might even cause great division between the old members and the new members. And can we really trust the new members? Can we hand the reins over to them? I mean, we don't know these 3,000, and, 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 and we haven't voted on everything, and we haven't done this, and we haven't done that. I don't know if we can do this. And there would be a whole week's worth, you can bet, of meetings for the pastor to attend each night to resolve these issues. See, my point is that I'm not really sure we always want what we ask for when we ask God for revival. The kinds of statements we make and the way that we respond to the outpouring of God's Spirit often reveals more about our heart, our true heart, than the hearts of those who are saved and redeemed. Jonah chapter 4 paints for us exactly that picture that I've just proposed to you a moment ago. Jonah is the mouthpiece of God, church. He's the prophet. He's the one representing Yahweh, the God of Israel, to the world. And what do we find out right away in verses 1 through 3? He despised the Ninevites, and it angered him that God had worked in their midst. He was among those that did neither anticipate nor participate in nor celebrate the moving of God. No, what we read instead in chapter 4 is a picture of an individual who did not want God moving in the lives of others. Now, none of us on the surface level are going to come out and say that or admit that. But it better be the message all of us wrestle with internally when we read Jonah chapter 4. Because as you read this chapter, you cannot help but see the interplay between God, a loving, merciful, compassionate God, and his representative who is heartless and loveless and peeved that he's working in the lives of people that Jonah doesn't like or trust. We read chapter 4 and we ask ourselves, do we see the lost the same way that God sees the lost? Do we see the lost the same way that God sees the lost? Write it down. Do I see lost people the same way God sees lost people? Look at verse 1 of chapter 4. But, but it displeased Jonah. Now we have to remember... Old Testament scriptures didn't have chapter and verse divisions 
This was one ongoing narrative. The it in chapter 4 and verse 1, the it refers back to what we read in chapter 3. In chapter 3, Jonah very reluctantly goes in and he preaches. And in verse 5, the people respond. They believe God and they repent in sackcloth and ashes. And even the king sends out a decree calling for a citywide repentance and turning to God. And verse 10 says, when God saw this, he, he withheld his hand of judgment. And that ticked off Jonah. That's what it says. It displeased him. It didn't displease him just a little bit. It didn't displease him some. It displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was angry. And in fact, he's so angry, look at verse 2, that he prays to the Lord and says, Oh, Lord, is not this what I said when I was yet in my country? That is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish. For I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. Therefore now, O oh Lord, please, please take my life from me. It's better for me to die than to live. I think Jonah's uh, DNA is still around in a lot of church members. He was a drama queen. Oh, I just want to die. Just take my life rather than have me live alongside these people. I'd rather you just kill me, Lord. The Lord says in verse 4, do you do well to be angry? In other words, are you responding appropriately here, Jonah? Verse 5, Jonah goes out of the city and he sits to the east of the city and he made a booth for himself there. Now see the little picture I put on the slide? Perfect Sunday school picture of Jonah sitting under his booth. A booth was a, a small shelter-like structure, something you could get under to keep the sun off of your head. And Jonah makes one, we're told, outside the city and he sits under it in the shade till he should see what would become of the city. You hear that? He didn't believe that the repentance was going to stick. He sits down outside the city and he folds his arms and he so desperately wants to see the Ninevites burn that he's going to sit out here and wait for the judgment of God to fall on them. He's not in town rejoicing with them. He's not doing follow-up ministry and knocking on doors and discipling and mentoring and teaching. No, no, no. He is displeased that people have turned to God. So he sits outside the, uh, the, the city and builds a booth over himself. And look what verse 6 tells us. The Lord sees exactly what he's doing. And the Lord God appoints a plant. And that plant grows up over Jonah. Oh, it provides him with shade. Shade over his big bald head. That's what happens, actually, because we find that out in verse 8. Sun beats down on his head, and the wind beats down on his head, and the only way that's uncomfortable is when you're bald, right? So, so Jonah gets this plant, and it grows up over him, and it gives him shade. And, and you're supposed to see here in the Hebrew, you're supposed to see in the latter part of verse 6, the irony of this statement. The Lord appointed a plant. It, it grew up over Jonah. It became a shade over his head to save him from his discomfort. And look at this. Jonah was exceedingly glad because of the plant. Now, wait a minute. Didn't we just read something about Jonah in verse 1 being exceedingly angry? So here's a prophet of God who is exceedingly angry because God has spared judgment on tens of thousands of people. Here's a prophet of God who is angry because God is working over here among people that he doesn't want to see God save. But he's exceedingly pleased when the Lord increases his comfort. The more comfortable Jonah is, the more pleased he is, right? Right, church? The more comfortable we are, the more pleased we are. What we don't like is that which takes us out of our comfort zone. So Jonah is exceedingly pleased. He's happy. He's glad when the plant comes up and gives him shelter. But look at verse 7. God's using this plant to teach him a lesson. When dawn came the next day, the same God who appointed the wind, the same God who appointed the waves, the same God who appointed the whale, the same God who appointed the weed, now appoints a worm. And Yahweh sends a worm, and this worm bores into the roots and attacks this plant, and the plant withers, 
and dies. The sun comes up in the sky, and here's God again, sovereign over all creation, sending a scorching east wind. And the sun beats down on Jonah's head. He's faint. He asks, here's the drama queen Jonah again, oh, I'd rather just die. It's better for me to die than to have a sunburn, you know. But God said to Jonah, do you do well to be angry for the plant? He'd asked him in verse 4 once, do you do well to be angry? Now he's asking him a second time. Are you responding appropriately, Jonah, by being upset about the death of a plant? A plant! I mean, we have lots of plants die at our house. And um, let me tell you, I've never cried for one of them. Ever. I've never been that upset about it. I've had gardens. We've grown gardens, and, and they've been fruitful and prosperous until bugs came in and took them over. And I've never sat out back and wept for my garden. God is asking Jonah, how come you're so emotional? How come you're, you're so upset about something that takes you, takes away your comfort? And Jonah justifies it at the end of verse 9 and says, yes, I am, Lord. He sounds like a 10-year-old sucking his thumb. I am okay to be mad. I'm right to be angry about this. And then God drives home the point in verses 10 and 11. Some commentators and theologians say verses 10 and 11 are really and truly the climax of the book. And what a beautiful and, 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 and powerful rhetorical device that the story should end by leaving us with a question. Here's the question, listen. You pity the plant for which you did not labor, nor did you make it grow, which came into being in a night and perished in a night. And should not I, God says, should not I pity Nineveh, that great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left. Some think this is a reference to children. Some think it's a reference to the illiteracy of the people, the ignorance of the people, that this is a rhetorical way of saying these are a people who are ignorant and do not know me. God's even concerned for the cattle. For all living things in this city, God has concern. And Jonah has none. Do we see the lost in our world the same way that God does? I'm only going to give you one point to chew on today because I realize what time it is now and I'm all about comfort, so I don't want to keep you too long. We'll finish the rest next week, but notice, just quickly, let's break down the prophet's protestation in verses 1 through 3. Just look at Jonah's protest and what it tells us about the heart of this complaining prophet. His complaint about divine mercy reveals his own lovelessness. And let that settle in for a moment. Because if you find yourself internally in turmoil and upset and distraught, because God is working in the lives of people around you and bringing about change in their lives and you don't think they deserve it. Or because the outpouring of God's Spirit is filling up His church with people that you don't recognize, that you didn't approve of, that you didn't have a say in. If you are in turmoil about the working of God in other people's lives, it may reflect more about your own lovelessness than what God is doing. Jonah was displeased. He was exceedingly displeased. He was angry. And look in verse 2. He calls this a prayer. <laughs> Jonah, under the inspiration of the Spirit, I believe, wrote this story many, many years after it happened. And he doesn't even attempt to make himself out to be a hero, does he? He's pretty brutally honest. This is one of those great evidences, I think, of the inspiration of Scripture. <laughs> if any of you were going to write a story right now, about one of the worst spiritual things that ever happened in your life 20 or 30 years ago, would you be this transparent? Would you be willing to tell everyone, you know, back in those days, I said I was a Christian, but the truth was I hated people. Everybody around me knew it. I was loveless, I was cranky, I was bitter, all I did was complain. Would you be willing to say, see, Jonah does that. 
He's telling us a story about himself in hindsight. And he lays it all out on the table. And I love how in verse 2, he says he, he prayed to the Lord. I don't think this was really prayer. I think this was complaint. <laughs> don't confuse the two, by the way. Your complaints to God are not prayers. They're just your complaints. He prays to God. And at the very least, we can say, the one thing we can admire is that he's honest. Because when speaking honestly with the Lord, we get to see into Jonah's heart. It sort of opens up a window for us. And notice the progression of this. Here's what we see when we look in Jonah's heart as revealed by his own prayer. We see first that he thought he could correct God. Did you see in verse 2? Oh Lord, is not this what I said when I was yet in my country? Jonah's not in his country now. So this statement refers back to the first calling and the first sending in chapter 1. And Jonah's telling us something here that we didn't get earlier. Jonah's telling us here that what happened earlier was that when God placed his call upon Jonah to go and preach to the Ninevites, Jonah decided he was going to correct the Lord. Hold on, Lord. Time out. I know what you're telling me to do, but let me tell you, okay? You don't know those Ninevites. You don't know how bad they are. You must not know how wicked they are. Apparently, Jonah began lecturing God back in Israel and informing God about why he was not going to go to Nineveh. He informed God of the fact that the Ninevites deserve judgment. As if God didn't know that. Of course he did. Uh, uh, Jonah, uh, maybe he informed God that he was the wrong man for the job. Don't send me. Jonah wanted God to relent. Jonah wanted God to do what Jonah wanted done. Jonah didn't want to do what God had told him to get done. Now let that sink in for a minute, church. Let that sink in. Jonah wanted to tell God, here's what you need to do. After God had already told Jonah, here's what I want you to do. How many of us recognize and realize that the Lord has already spoken to the church once for all about what we're to do, where we're to be? The Great Commission sends us into the world, empowered by the Holy Spirit, to preach the gospel and make disciples of, of, of who? Of all people. Red, yellow, black, white, single, married, divorced, broken home, good home, ex-con, clean life, educated, uneducated. The Lord doesn't set parameters for us. He tells us to go into the world and to reach them. Well, who's my neighbor, Lord? Who would you have me to love? Whoever you have an opportunity to love. Whoever comes across your path. Well, what about, what about uh, they might not fit in my church. That's not for you to determine, the Lord says. My church is open to all. Yeah, but they're not like us. That's okay. You share in the common bond of the Holy Spirit and the love of Christ, and that's all that matters. You go into the world and make disciples. And what do we want to do? We want to argue with God and tell him why we can't. Now, apparently, Lord, you haven't looked over Grant County lately. These people out here are rough. There's drug addicts out here, Lord. He knows. Well, apparently, Lord, you haven't looked out and seen, you know, some of, the, some of the places around the county that aren't so savory. Those aren't safe places, Lord. He knows. And he still says go. Well, Lord, I'm not sure those people would, would fit in. Oh, we have a certain crowd here at the church, and I'm not sure they would be welcome. He knows, and he still says go and preach the gospel and tell them all. Why don't we make a commitment together today to stop telling the Lord what we're willing to do and just obey what he's already told us to do? We can't correct the Great Commission. We can't perfect it. We can't make it better than it already is. No, we simply have to obey it. God knows exactly what he's doing in sending us into the world to reach new people. He knows exactly what he's doing in building up this church and putting it in this community and empowering us with gifted people to go into the world and preach the gospel. We don't need to correct him like the prophet did. Jonah corrected him, and when he didn't get his way, look at verse 2, he rejected him. Oh, this is so like us. He argues with the Lord, but he doesn't win. And when he loses the argument with the Lord, what's he do? He runs away. 
That is why, look, look at verse 2. That is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish. Hey, Jonah, why are you running from God? Because he won't do what I want him to do. And he won't do it my way. You've got to put your hands on your hips when you say it. Because this is exactly the way church people are. He won't do it the way I want him to do it. This church won't do things the way I want them to do it, so I'm going to stop coming. I'm going to take my toys, I'm going to go home. I'm going to quit coming. I'll go to another church. I'm going to run from what the Lord has called me to do. I'm going to reject His commissioning upon me. I'm going to argue with Him a little bit first, and when I don't get my way, I will just refuse to participate. This confession of Jonah in verse 2 reveals clearly what was in his heart. He ran from God because he didn't even want the Assyrians to have a chance. They deserve it, Jonah says. They deserve everything they're going to get. They're just reaping what they sowed. And they deserve judgment. And God, if you don't see that, then I'm going the other direction. He corrected. He rejected. His rejection was based on verse 2. The fact that he respected God as well. See the words, I knew, I knew, I knew. Jonah knew something. Indeed, he knew something about God. And here's what he knew about Yahweh of Israel. That God was gracious. And that he's merciful. And that he is slow to anger. That he is abounding in steadfast love. And that he relents from disaster. How did Jonah know that about God? Jonah had experienced that in his relationship with God. Do you know God to be gracious? If you have been born again in Christ, you have had the grace of God poured out on you, not because you deserved it. You deserve judgment. I deserve judgment. I deserve hell for my sins. What I receive instead, by the grace of God, is forgiveness. Do you know God to be merciful? Do you know God to be merciful? Mercy is when you don't get what you deserve. Mercy is, is saying, mercy, uncle, uncle, and not getting what you deserve. Do you know God to be merciful? Do you know God... From your own experience to be slow to anger? Oh, how many of us for years have pushed all the wrong buttons with God? I mean, how many of us have just walked all the way out on the edge of the Christian life? Just, a, just an eyelash away from our own destruction. How many of us have tempted God's patience? How many of us have been unrepentant at times in our lives and God could have rightly and without any hesitation poured out a can of whooping on you? And he didn't. You know God to be slow to anger. And in fact, instead of pouring out a can of whooping on you, which he deserved, what he did instead was he continued to pour out his love upon you. He abounded in steadfast love. And there were times when you know that disaster was imminent or inevitable in your life and that judgment was deserved from what you did and God rescued you from it. See, Jonah was a walking, talking example of all of these things. But here's the mistake he made. He deemed himself worthy of receiving these things, but not others. Be careful, church. Be careful. Lest we walking in the grace of Christ having known about the saving work of Jesus Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit, those of us who have been redeemed have been quickened from the dead and regenerated unto new life, and the Spirit of God opens our eyes and teaches us things about God from the Scriptures, and we know these things from experience. But be careful lest you find yourself in the position of trying to be the arbiter of who deserves this grace in the world and who doesn't. Because that's not our place. We preach the gospel to all. We invite all. We go in love to all. And we plead with them. Trust Christ. Turn from your sins. Be born again. 
Jonah knew this about God, and he respected it about God, and it actually became the foundation of why he ran from God. He knew God was this merciful, and if he went and preached, God was going to be merciful to people that didn't deserve it. So after trying to correct God, he rejects him out of his respect, and then finally he requested that God take his life. I find a great irony in this. Great irony in this statement. I've got to close this out here. But there's tremendous irony in the fact that Jonah is God's mouthpiece. He's God's representative to the world. And look at what he's saying. I'd rather die than be obedient to you. Jonah, the mouthpiece of God, is saying, I'd rather you just take my life than than I would be obedient. I, I honestly think there's a lot of Christians today that would rather say, Lord, just go ahead and take me out of this world because I can't do the things you want me to do. I can't be patient and kind and loving to the people you want me to be patient and kind and loving to. I can't forgive the people you want me to forgive. And so you might as well just take me, Lord. I'd rather die than change. A lot of churches would rather die than change. A lot of churches today are dying because they refuse to change. They refuse to represent God in the world, to speak his word in love to all. And like Jonah the prophet, they will dig their heels in and people will say, we'd rather die than be obedient. And we're saying it to the God who himself has already wrapped himself in flesh, walked in our midst, and died for us. Church, God isn't asking you to, to die for anything. He's asking you to live in obedience. He's not calling us to give up our lives. He's calling us to give our lives. And we don't need to die individually or corporately as a church. Rather than change, what we need is a pouring out of God's Spirit to bring us into a place of obedience where we say, not Kill me, Lord, I'd rather die than change. But where we say, Lord, send us into this world that we might tell others of the one who's already died for them, Jesus Christ. Would you rather change or die? Would you rather God pour out his spirit upon you and and fill you with his love. Remember what we sing? Revive us again. Fill each heart with thy love. Well, let me tell you what it's going to look like when he fills your heart with his love. You're going to start loving people in the pews, out in the community, all around you with a love you didn't know you had. And that love is going to rekindle, rekindle a fire. Revival fires that could change this church change this community, change this world. But not if you'd rather die than change. You don't need to die. You just need to obey the Lord. Stop arguing with him. Stop trying to correct his plan. Stop threatening to run away and reject and take your toys and go home. Just obey the Lord. Do what he says. Commit yourself today to making disciples in the world around us and advancing the cause of Christ at home and abroad and see what God will do. Father, I'm just bringing this to a close, Lord, for the sake of time this morning, but I'm, I'm, I'm vexed. My own heart is heavy because this passage is so powerful. We pray for revival, but Lord, would we be ready to receive it when it came? If you poured it out upon us today and we had those Acts 241 type moments, would we be ready to change and receive and invest our lives into those you send our way? Now we've said and heard and done a lot this morning and I'm thankful for your people's patience and grace, but Lord, we need this. We need it this holiday season. We need it every season. And it may be that there's someone here today who's not born again, who's not a Christian, and just in hearing the message of your love and how much you love broken people like the Ninevites, they may understand today that you love them. You love them enough to send your son. You love them enough to forgive them of their sins by grace 
through faith in Christ alone. Oh, Father, I pray that you would draw today through the preaching of your word. I pray that you would draw your people into yourself. Speak to us now as we sing during this time of decision. In Christ's name, amen. Would you stand with us this morning? And as we sing, the response is simple. If the Spirit of God is speaking and saying, you need to go get some prayer. You need some counsel. You need to join this church. You need to trust Christ. If the Spirit of God is speaking, obey Him today and come as we sing. Come, ye sinners, Lord.